our YouTube uh, in about six months. Um, it's also, of course, streaming live right now on YouTube if you would rather watch it there, but you're here in Zoom. So hello to anyone in our YouTube audience as well. Um, I am Kate and I am going to be uh, moderating uh, this webinar, but it's mostly everyone else is who you see here is a uh, tale to tell, but I'm Kate. I am the uh, a library service engineer at EBSCO and on behalf of the NASIC Continuing Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you to our January webinar. Um, the title of our webinar is Streaming Content Platform Migrations, What Do Librarians Need to Know and What Can They Do to Help? And that is being presented by uh, Matthew Raguchi, Athena Hepner, and Kim uh, Steinle. St did I pronounce that right or did I destroy it? Okay, I thought I did, but I was like, you never know. My brain sometimes falls apart. Uh, so uh, before the presentation, a uh, few account announcements. This webinar, as I said, is being recorded. Anyone who has registered for this webinar is going to receive a link to this uh, shortly following the presentation. Secondly, if you have any questions for any of our presenters during the presentation, there is a Q&A button. This is our webinar uh, um, on Zoom. So there's a Q&A button down there. Please enter your questions into the Q&A and I will be monitoring that. Uh, the presenters are going to answer your questions at the end of their presentation. So enter them throughout the presentation, but we will be getting to them at the end. And of course, when the webinar is over, we're hoping it works, but there should be a survey link that pops up uh, for SurveyMonkey. We hope that you will take a bit of time to fill it out and let us know how we're doing, what we can do better. And of course, we're always really interested to hear any ideas for future webinars that we can do. Um, so I'm going to, with that, turn it over to our speakers who I will introduce. Um, so we've got Kim, and Kim is the Library Relations and Sales Manager uh, at Duke University Press. Kim has worked with the press for over 15 years and is responsible for institutional subscription revenue through the sale of electronic collections and through communication with the library community. Advocating for library interest is in the development and implementation of pricing models is a priority for Kim. As an active participant in major library conferences, she serves on several committees with a special interest in publisher librarian collaboration. And Matthew is the Associate Director of Product Marketing and Wiley's resident librarian. He provides insight on metadata sharing strategies for optimizing its electronic resources for discovery, access, and usage. This includes working closely with librarians and library solutions providers alike to get the tools that they need to help the end user. His interests are cataloging, metadata, data standards, and the user experience. Matthew also moonlights as a reference and instruction librarian. And Athena is the electronic resources librarian at the University of Central Florida. She has 25 years of department spanning experience in academic libraries. She began in reference and instruction, where she indulged a love for public services, then moved to library systems to explore a fascination with computers and technology. Athena now resides in acquisition, where she coordinates e-resources acquisitions and maintains systems that enhance discovery and access. Athena's work and research, center, and research center on applying technology to connect users to content. Her projects explore usability, user interfaces, and technology for improving discovery of and access to information. And so with that, with our really awesome panelists, uh, I am going to turn it over to you all. So it's the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Kate for those kind introductions. And I just wanted to extend my thanks to the NASA Continuing Education Committee for helping coordinate this event, specifically Kate and uh, Adele Fitzgerald and Jennifer Pate for taking on this topic. Uh, it's something that's very near and dear to our hearts. And we'll hope that you'll learn something and become interested in as well. As so I'm sure most of you have had some sort of experience with content platform migrations in the past. Uh, I did also want to thank the NISO Content Platform Migrations Working Group and their co-chairs, Athena and, and Kim, for coming here today and talking about this, uh, this endeavor. And um, I just also wanted to mention this is a co-sponsored event by the, um, as well by the NASIC uh, Standards Committee uh, as well. So uh, moving on to the main event here. So I, I think we've all been introduced pretty thoroughly by Kate. Um, so I, I just wanted to give you a chance to meet the presenters um, myself, uh, Athena and Kim, I don't know if you guys want to come up and just say hi really quick to associate a name um, with a face. Hi, I'm Athena. Hi, I'm Kim. 
Great. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, so we've got the introductions out of the way. That's great. Um, so this, the rest of the presentation is really just going to be three or four parts. Um, first, I'm going to be speaking about the publisher perspective on migrations, um, specifically with Wiley Online Library or flagship app platform. And they'll be hearing from Athena, who's going to discuss the librarian perspective on migrations, which are uh, very different than the publisher migration. And then uh, Kim is going to be closing, uh, providing a, an overview of the content platform migration working group and the call to action and submitting feedback in the draft for public comment. That is the what you can do to help portion of this uh, presentation of the uh, with a rather like lengthy title. So the publisher migration experience, um, I just wanted to start out by saying that um, it, I think being a former librarian myself, I used to think that uh, publishers and platform providers rather made these decisions arbitrarily um, and sometimes at the expense of the library, but now having sort of defected to the publisher side and understanding the um, very complex work involved with this, decisions are not made arbitrarily. Um, there are often cost and resources um, and just things and factors that really have to be considered. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, the migration experience can be rather harrowing at times, but, um, you know, proper planning prevents uh, poor performance is, um, I believe, that acronym of the five P's that we try to um, adhere to whenever we undergo something um, that's so uh, extensive and uh, significant. So I just wanted to call that out really quick that I, I don't think that publisher decisions on these sorts of things are arbitrary, uh, that there are, you know, pretty thorough rationale that sort of goes into them. But let me speak um, specifically of the, the Wiley context of platforms, because we are no stranger to migrations. Uh, so I just picked out some key events that have happened in the 13 years that sort of relate the platforms. Um, in 2007, Wiley acquired Blackwell um, Publishing. So uh, for a time, at least at the migration, uh, there were two sort of disparate platforms existing um, that were rather siloed. Uh, you had Blackwell Synergy and Wiley Inner Science existing at the same time. And in 2010, those two platforms came together to form our homegrown Wiley Online Library that had all of that content uh, together. There are things that have happened in the six plus years since the, the original launch of Wiley Online Library, but the most significant event happened for platforms was when Wiley acquired Adapon. Um, so Wiley did this for a few reasons. You can read the press releases about it. Certainly helps diversify Wiley's portfolio. But uh, in this context, what it really does, I think, is help um, you know Wiley's ability to um, use their uh, Adapon's Literatum product, which is their publishing platform. Um, to sort of take put resources on Adapon to develop the, um, the platform to better need, uh, user needs, right? So uh, that acquisition happened in 2016. And then not surprisingly in 2018, the homegrown Wiley Online Library moved to Literatum, the, the Adapon version of the platform. And there have been some um, take-ons of additional content since, uh, namely uh, Blackwell Reference Online or Bro, which was previously hosted by Highwire, that moved to Wiley Online Library and um, Access, which is the, I believe it's the Alliance Prop Soil and Environmental Study Society. Um, that acronym is always confusing when there are access issues with access titles, uh, but the, um, they, they had a, a large number of book content and journal content and take on content, which also um, required a sort of migration of sorts. So we are no strangers to platform migration, as you might imagine. Um, and I'm going to talk about specifically about uh, Wiley's move to uh, Literatum in 2018. So as I said, um, Wiley Online Library is it's our flagship platform. It contains the majority of the portfolio that is um, sold and made available to, to libraries and researchers. Uh, that contains 1,600 uh, journals that are you know, continuing publication right now, uh, almost 24,000 online books, 250 reference works, um, current protocols and lab manuals. There's a lot of content. So as you imagine, this was not just sort of moving a handful of journals to something new, which was a, a rather um, significant endeavor. Uh, but really what this move represented was our move from this homegrown platform, right, to something that was known and that, that was constantly changing and um, you know, meeting the evolving needs of those who interact with the platform and, and add upon Zotorata. But this did require um, a lot of intensive cross-team collaboration. So um, I'm, a, I'm on the marketing team, but obviously the product colleagues, both on the Wiley and Adapon side, had to meet daily for several hours 
uh, leading up to the migration event, which was pretty intensive, but also sales colleagues were involved, support colleagues were involved, marketing colleagues were involved. Um, this was no short effort and I, I learned a lot about members from the, uh, the product team on both the Wiley and Adapon side after this, uh, this project. Uh, we were also able to leverage external relationships. So um, I, I'd act as a liaison for some of the library solution vendors. Um, you probably know them as EBSCO, Exlibris, or ProQuest Exlibris, uh, OCLC, TDNet, um, WT Cox, all those folks um, who actually were able to help us get the, uh, the migration message out. And my role in the migration was the, what I like to call communication czar, uh, specifically for the librarian audience. And my rule of thumb for, for um, communicating information to libraries was to try to communicate early and communicate often. And sometimes that wasn't really easy because there was new information or waiting on information to develop, but this really um, required uh, consistent planning or rather um, extensive planning um, to develop a cadence that sort of what we understood would fit for, for other libraries um, and my own experience as a librarian, but um, really just thorough planning and ensure to make this um, sort of a, a, a pleasant experience or as pleasant as possible for libraries. The other thing to note about this particular migration was it was a hard cut over. So it didn't leave a lot of room for error. And what that means is essentially is when the old platform got turned off, the new platform got turned on, you know, simultaneously. I mean, it was over the course of 48 hours, but um, still <laughs> once the old content was gone, the new content was coming in. Um, some uh, content providers, publishers, platforms, you know, decide to hold um, or let two platforms exist at the same time, right, simultaneously, which creates less of an imperative to make a, a quick move. But because this was a hard cut over for us, um, it really um, didn't leave, leave a lot of room for error. I could talk a lot about, uh, you know, all of the content and, and work behind getting all that information up on the website. But what I really wanted to talk about was the data exchange and things that really matter to libraries. So like I said, um, I was a librarian before, I know very much about these sort of pain points and struggles um, that migrations can bring for libraries. But the fundamental question, I think, um, for me at least, and what I pushed on my product colleagues and met upon as well, is um, you know, uh, linking where this content lives and will, will the users be able to access it, right? So from our point of view, having redirects um, really proved essential. And we have a lot of resources. We were able to put redirects on where the content used to live to where it would live um, you know, fairly quickly, um, despite the large uh, number of, um, you know, if you think about all the article and chapter level links and, you know, and title level things. But um, again, not a lot of publishers would, you know, can do that with ease. But it is really important because not in spite of our best efforts, not everyone gets the message that we migrated until after it happened. So these links really proved essential in mitigating the amount of post-migration problems that we had. But that being said, we needed to tell our library solution vendor partners where this content was going to live. So if you think about things like link resolvers, open URL parameters, were they changing with the old and new Wiley Online Library, uh, KBART files, with links and targets for specific destinations, mark records, which have URLs embedded in them, chapter and article level metadata, where we're, we're putting DOIs and that, that sort of information. And all those things had to be updated, um, which was no small feat as well. Um, and a shout out to our partners at OCLC who helped us with easy proxy and making sure that the OCLC hosted uh, libraries had the right stanza or updated stanza, um, you know, coordinating with the syncing of the new platform launching um, and then making sure that the locally hosted libraries had, you know, the stanzas where that content was going to live so they could manage that themselves. And another shout out to Crossref as well. As you can imagine, the digital object is identify or DOI um, was pointing to where the content used to live at a certain point. So we had to time all of the chapter and article level DOIs um, for all of our content to sync with the launch of the platform, making sure that it was pointing with the right place, or if it wasn't, creating some sort of alias to make sure that it would go to the right spot. Um, and yeah, as you can imagine, there was a lot of, um, a lot of metadata and um, making sure that this worked just the right time. And usage data as well. So we kept the old platform on life support for library administrators for a little bit because we didn't want to create an environment where um, you know, users had to download all of their usage statistics um, and then when the new platform launched, it would go away. So we actually used the Counter 5 rollout in 2019 as an opportunity to bring the legacy Counter 4 statistics onto the new platform, but also um, providing statistics in Counter 5 as well. So we kind of left 
um, some of that stuff um, around for at least for a little bit so that libraries would not be left uh, hanging when they needed those statistics because they're so important, right, in, in renewal decisions. So the resources that we had here, and some of you may have seen this stuff before, if you remember the, the Wiley Online Library migration um, almost three years ago, it seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, but the, the most important thing that we had, I think, was a, a hub site containing information about the, the migration. And I'll go through these resources one by one, uh, and not just for librarians, but also for researchers, for authors, for societies, a lot of different needs and FAQs had to go onto this site as well as, as, well as posting news and information uh, that would be relevant to, um, you know, to these different user groups and stakeholders. We also had a little email campaign, again, like I said, communicating early and often. Uh, we wanted to, or my initiative was to get out the word to every single librarian that we had in our, our uh, customer retail management system. So we had um, something like 30,000 librarian contacts, and it might have been annoying to get an email, but again, we just want to make sure that everyone knew the migration was happening before it was happening and then to let them know the calls to action and things that they might want to prepare for prior to launch. So we sent messages um, two months out and then um, another one one month out and then leading up to right before the migration and then after the migration as a check-in. We had a brief checklist of one page or things that you know librarians you know should probably the more critical things that librarians should be trying to look at beyond access we also had a more thorough technical FAQ, a 30 page document, um, which I think had SEO optimization, but um, making sure that a, you know, the enterprising electronic resource librarian, technically minded librarian had a question about our open URL, that we were transparent about the information, you know, what, what was changing when we moved to Literatum. So having all that information up front and making sure that we updated that as new information came in. And a URL crosswalk document, uh, which resembles a, a KBARC file, but um, again, creating, um, providing information on where the content, you know, what the syntax, what the linking syntaxes were at a high level for things like table of contents and PDFs and full text HTMLs and, um, you know, journal about pages, um, but then also the specific title level information of, you know, where the, what, the, what the old URL looks like, what the, old, the new URL was gonna look like as well. Um, and also sharing this information with the library solutions vendors. Uh, including key information like unique identifiers, DOIs, uh, ISBNs, ISSNs, OSN, OCNs, those sorts of things to, do, to make it easier. And again, providing transparency um, and helping mitigate um, post-migration issues around linking. And then training the support staff, um, our just global support staff are not librarians like myself. So making sure that they were well-versed in all of these things uh, before we launched so that they can answer questions for those, um, those librarians who had um, issues. So I could easily tell you about every single challenge that I had for the rest of this webinar, and I'm not going to do that. I'm just talking about the really the more salient points um, that I would sort of uh, advise for other publishers, and which I think will be a nice lead into Athena's uh, and, and Kim's piece uh, of the presentation. So the rolling launch date was something that was a bit of a challenge for us. Um, the, the, the launch date um, moved twice, I think, which, you know, it moved up by a month and then two months, uh, which was a bit difficult for us to manage because then we had to um, send out messages accordingly, but also um, the no, the go, no go decision to launch was made uh, 40 hours prior to launch. Um, and again, that required us to scramble to get an email out. And um, unfortunately, um, there were some libraries who didn't learn about the launch or, you know, didn't get the confirmation until after it happened, thinking specifically about our um, Asian Pacific colleagues, because it was lost during a time zone based on when this decision was made. Uh, so it was a bit frustrating for us. Uh, meeting all stakeholder needs, my area of focus during this migration was on the librarians, but as I said, there are plenty of other people who interact with the platform and have different needs. Our society partners, uh, authors, our researchers and readers, um, they, you know, my library and technical FAQ about open URLs and KBARTs were not all that interesting to society um, executives. So um, again, different um, FAQs had to be developed meet those and, and trying to make sure that, um, you know, their needs were met. Uh, pretty challenge because I learned a lot about different audiences too. And post-migration troubleshooting as much as we tried um, to provide information early and often and enough of it, um, there were still issues um, that happened after the fact. And we created these things called rescue accounts where it was kind of break glass in case of emergency button where, um, you know, in institutional access needed to be provided to a specific institution for everything, at least until we resolved uh, access issues, um, you know, that there were sort of that, that didn't get carried over with the um, the old platform and, and old systems. 
But the prevalent question that I had, the one question that kept me up at night throughout this whole thing was, did we do this right? Uh, I had experiences of librarians that I tried to uh, employ. I looked at um, what other publishers were doing. Um, like for example, Kim at Duke University Press, they did a fine job. Um, and they said that imitation is a sincere form of flattery. Um, so I did borrow a little bit from, from Duke University Press and other publishers to see what they were doing um, as well and how they communicated and how they got those resources out. Uh, I spoke to other librarians, but um, you know, we, we didn't really have a playbook for doing this. We were kind of figuring it was all you know, new ground to us as we were figuring all this out. I'm much more experienced now, but this is really the use case, I think, for this group, which Kim is gonna talk about later, is um, providing guidelines and standards. And we all love standards because everyone should be held accountable to the same, um, <laughs> same expectations, I think, although you know, not all, all publishers and content providers are created equally and have those sort of resources, but at least some sort of playbook to, that they can aspire to, which is what the recommended practice, I think, um, really is. Uh, but we, should, uh, we did take some solace in the fact that we sent a post-migration survey um, out and librarians were, you know, overwhelmingly positive about the resources that we received about this with the one bugaboo really being um, that rolling launch date and then some folks not being contacted in time, which unfortunately was not much we could have done. But um, that was the publisher experience. And um, I'd actually like to pass over to, to Athena, who's going to talk about the, the librarian experience. Hi. Um... Thank you, Matthew. In my role at the University of Central Florida, I um, do a lot of the electronic resources librarian sorts of things. And a lot of the emails about migrations come to me. So um, I'm, I'm deeply involved whenever there is a migration that we need to respond to. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my experience and uh, I'm also borrowing some of the slides from one of uh, the committee members who was on this work group was um, Kim Moon from, or wait, wait, I'm remembering the wrong name. It was, oh man, yeah. Song. Oh, now I'm stuttering. I should have had this written down in front of me, but I've borrowed some slides from one of the uh, committee members uh, from North Carolina State University. All right, so next slide, please, Matthew. Um, yeah, it was Chow Mein Song. I don't know why I couldn't think of that a second ago. Uh, so from the librarian's perspective, often the first thing we know uh, about a migration happening is coming from an email notification from the publisher. Occasionally, we'll see them from listservs, um, occasionally from knowledge base vendors. And in worst case scenarios, we may get an email from colleagues or users, uh, and that that means that it's already something has changed and we didn't know about it in advance to, to respond to it, which is not great. But usually we do get an email from publishers these days and they vary quite a lot. Sometimes they're well in advance of the migration. Sometimes it's a relatively short turnaround. Sometimes there's other more detailed pages that they link to and sometimes it's uh, everything's right there in the email as much as they have to tell us. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So frequently the notification will tell us things like what resources are going to be impacted, when it's going to happen, is it going to be a hardcover or whether there will be two platforms running simultaneously, and will the old links be redirected permanently and so forth. So these are things that we do need to know and sometimes we'll need more detail than all of these, um, but really what we need to figure out is what actions do we need to take. Um, about the timing of the communication. Now, Matthew mentioned a lot about timing. And I briefly mentioned in my previous slide that sometimes the timing is really well in advance of when the actions that we need to take will be. And that can be difficult. So it, it, it really requires you to track, oh, I know that in two months they're going to do this cutover and I have time to prepare, but what can I do right now? So things like looking at the URL crosswalks and preparing along those lines, it can be useful to have it in advance, but also you really need to plan to set up uh, actions for yourself at different times in the migration. And let's go ahead and look at the next slide for some of what those actions might be. So here's some of the to-do list. You will maybe need to think about your usage. Um, frequently the usage is going to be 
available only on the old platform and then the new usage on the new platform will be available there and you'll have to store usage for the different platforms separately. Um, <clears throat> so archiving your usage, getting your old holdings information and preparing all of the information that you can get about the old platform, getting it all consolidated, setting up new administrator accounts, um, figuring out what to tell the public services librarians and when. You'll definitely need to tell them that there's a new URL to expect maybe a new branding and new functionality. Um, but they probably don't need to know the particulars of URL crosswalks. Hopefully, if there's a good redirect, they are not going to have to do anything with their URLs. Um, updating MARC records can be a Herculean task. Um, <clears throat> we have had, in some cases, we went to go and update the URLs in our 856 records, and we will find things that are 10 years old or older, and those URLs have been redirected for years, and then trying to figure out how to make those map to the new URL. Sometimes it, there is no algorithmic approach where you can say search for this and replace it with that. And it's going to have to be, maybe we just try and reload new records and get rid of those old records. So definitely allow time for that because it can be more complicated than anyone is thinking about because of the long legacy of those records you may have to deal with. Um, of course, your authentication can be as easy as the, the vendor has set up a new stanza and you, as soon as you turn that on, everything's gonna work perfectly, but often there will be hitches to think about and discover. So <clears throat> you'll need to test those new links, test the new functionality. And all of this is maybe a little bit easier to do if there are dual platforms, but if it's a hard cutover, the timing for this can be a little bit tricky. So you need to test things as much in advance as you can but um, you may be have to wait to really discover what didn't work as expected. Uh, communication is also something we do want to get the communication from the publishers, but we also want to see them communicating, uh, the vendors and the communicate publishers communicating to other service providers like the knowledge base providers, like the uh, OCLC and Easy Proxy and Open Athens, so that we are not the only ones who are saying hey, Ex Libris, does your knowledge base have the new URLs in the discovery you know, for um, the linking? So um, finally, we do want to, after the migration, we need to verify that the holdings all moved and that the, the functionality works as expected. There's been several migrations where we discovered that content did not migrate quite like we expected. And, maybe old titles for things are now represented in a new way. So there's always things to discover and find out. Uh, could you move on to the next slide? This is borrowed from um, the uh, North Carolina State University. This is their version, I believe it's Trello, but I'm not sure right now, yes, uh, the cards they use to track the various migrations. So as libraries, we see a lot of these every year. Um, I think when we did an uh, in, informal survey, there were over 30 migrations that librarians reported in a two-year period. And um, so there's a lot to track for each of these. And so using Trello or some other project management can help you make sure that you didn't skip the steps that you have when you first got that email that's two months before anything's going to happen, that you can still track it when you need to start checking things like, did we get our statistics? Do we have the URL crosswalk? Is someone on it? So this is a very organized approach. In many cases, it may be just um, email archives and spreadsheets, but this is a very nice way to do it. Okay, next slide, please. Um, some snags that we may run into. I mentioned earlier the no migration notice. That's a very bad thing that can happen, usually not with the big vendors, but for particularly if academics or libraries aren't the main market, there might not have been the usual sort of email uh, in advance that we might expect. Because a lot of websites are used to being able to change on the fly and their customer base just changes with them as needed. Um, so uh, there could be challenges in identifying the right ILS records, problems with older content and URLs. I, I mentioned some of that earlier. 
Um, so one of the big things that's mentioned on this slide and is relevant to the little graph below is if you're migrating during the peak period and classes already have URLs embedded, it's hard to get the word out to the faculty and students about a change in the middle of the semester. Faculty particularly don't really understand the URLs and authentication all that well. So changing on the dime in the middle of the semester can be difficult. Um, and the peak period in the US might be this September through December, but we've found out through the process of communicating, the, this committee has talked to a lot of people over the last year. Some institutions in other countries have different peak periods. So I don't know what to tell vendors about when to migrate, but it can be a problem if it happens in the middle of the semester for some big organizations that use them a lot. Dual platforms seem like a great idea, but they can lead to problems. For instance, if the links to uh, the, the content on the old platform are linking to actually a different version of the content, we had that happen where we were having a problem with one of the textbooks that people are using with blurry play pages, and we told the vendor. The vendor said, we fixed it, take a look. We looked and we're still seeing blurry pages. Well, they fixed it on the new platform, but the content on the old platform that we were linking to hadn't been fixed. It took a while to figure that out. And we've also had cases where um, whole years of content didn't migrate. And it was old, not very often used, but we have some very detail-oriented librarians who were looking specifically to make sure that we had access to everything. And we had to communicate and eventually get that restored. Next slide, please. All right, let's move on to Kim talking about the working group. Thanks, Athena. Uh, so as uh, Athena was saying, um, there's so many migrations. Um, so in doing the, um, I think Athena, you did a straw poll maybe over a year ago. Um, and what we found out um, is that everybody, vendors, librarians, publishers, everybody is dealing with migrations. And really the number is just increasing. Um, so Matthew, I think if you yeah, go to this slide, you can get just a sense of um, who, who is dealing with how many. Um, certainly content platform vendors, that's their, you know, their main role. Um, publishers, you know, even if it's one every 10 years, it, it, it feels, it feels like a lot. I, you know, we did a migration back in 2017 and, you know, I still have very strong memories of it. Um, and little things come up here and there, even though it's been um, several years now. Um, but then when you look at librarians, they are having to deal with so many migrations and they're all different. They, there are similarities, absolutely, but there are also differences in every single one. So, you know, I think that our group feels really passionate about um, getting some um, recommended practices out there um, to make things easier for everyone, but especially for librarians who are really bearing the brunt of um, having to deal with so many um, along with their other responsibilities. So, um, right. So Athena and I are, we, we co-chair um, and we have such a wonderful group um, of uh, folks that are volunteering, including Matthew and so many others um, that are coming um, with different experiences, uh, coming from different parts of the industry. So one of the things that I think is exciting is having everybody in the same room. Um, you know, publishers tend to, from my perspective, talk to librarians and talk to vendors. Um, but content platform vendors and librarians, I think, tend not to have direct interaction. And so this working group has been a place where we can all share experiences and talk and learn from each other. And so I know I've learned a lot and I think the rest of the group would probably um, say the same um, from, from all of the different meetings um, that we've been having. So we've been meeting for maybe, gosh, 
I think it's about a year, maybe a little bit more. Um, and, you know, so you can see the things that that we've been trying to do. Um, and right now we're really so close um, to the end of getting um, the first draft um, of the recommended practice out. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, what are we trying to do? Um, and you can see here, I mean, we want to make everything easier um, for everybody and come up with um, some standards or, you know, we're saying recommended practices, we want to standardize things. Um, we want to um, come up with a checklist, a resource that everybody in the industry who is dealing with a migration um, can use, um, whether they're um, just doing a migration for the first time, which some publishers, smaller publishers may be in that situation. Um, or, you know, someone who has gone through many migrations, maybe they want to streamline um, and they can use the um, this document um, to help them to help them out. So if we go to the next slide, um, what are some things that that we've done? You know, we've done a lot of work over the past year um, to gather information. You know, we gathered information initially um, when we were first starting out um, to just ask folks what is important to you in um, a migration? What has gone wrong? What has gone right? Um, People had a lot of feedback. Um, so what's exciting about this project is that there were um, so many people that were willing to talk with us. We were able to do interviews. We had no problem getting people to come on um, to the working group and uh, you know provide their feedback. Because again, everybody you know has a horror story. Uh, you know, some people have success stories too, but I think a lot of people um, had um, some, some good advice for us to be sure that you include um, this, this or that. Um, and, you know, the main thing that I think both Matthew and Athena said, and I'm going to say it again, is at the absolute top of the list is communicating often um, and um, being clear in your communications. Um, so, and I think Abby, who was on our, Abby Wicks um, at Duke now, um, was on our working group um, in, in the beginning. So thank you, Abby says that it's never a bad thing to have an email about a platform migration. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, let's see, what else? Um, so we, we looked at what other um, vendors had done uh, in their communications. Um, and, you know, everybody did something different. So, you know, we at Duke had done something um, and uh, then we were able to look at um, what Wiley had done and it was different from what we had done. And so I think at, in looking at all of the different um, vendor communications, what I hope that we've done is pulled the best things out of those, uh, of each of those, um, and put those into the recommendations and put those into um, one of the deliverables is going to be a checklist um, for each stakeholder. Um, let's see, let's go to the next slide. Um, and, you know, something that we, we didn't want we didn't want to recreate the wheel in terms of all of the wonderful work that's been done already um, with NISO um, and other um, groups in, in terms of standards. So you can see, I mean, here's a list um, of, of different standards that we point to. Um, we don't need to rewrite anything. There's already really great information about these standards. Um, but something that we realized, you know, and especially me coming from Duke, a university press, you know, there were a few things that um, we didn't know about. Um, certainly some of the, the bigger, you know, major standards we were aware of, but we realized that everybody coming to a migration has different information and a different um, level of expertise. So, we wanted to make sure that we were referring to um, some resources that are already available um, in the industry. Um, so another deliverable that's going to come out of um, this project is going to be a glossary um, so that we can point people to existing resources that we feel like they may want to be aware of um, as they're going through the migration. 
Okay, so where are we now? Um, right, so we've got a checklist, a glossary, and recommendations, and we really are very close um, to getting that draft out for public comment. Um, I would I would guess that it will be next month. There will be a big splash, um, and certainly, you know, we will put um, information out on all the listservs. Um, to to get your feedback. So really, you will see that coming, I hope, within um, about a month, a month's time. Um, yeah, so let's skip to, right, the, the next. I mean, you know, I, I, and I think, I mean, we want this to be the best um, set of recommendations that it, it can be. And of course, you know, I'm biased. I think it's pretty darn great, um, but I feel like it will only get better um, if we get feedback, um, you know, so to this group and, you know, to a more, um, a, a wider group across the industry, we're really gonna be asking for feedback. And I realize um, everyone's busy, everyone has other things to do, but, you know, my feeling is if, if you're here and you're passionate about platform migrations, or if you have those horror stories, or if you say, hey, I'm a librarian and I'd love to give publishers a little bit of information about what they could do better, you know, we invite you to review um, the draft during the public comment period and give us your feedback. Um, because what I can say is the group is, again, really passionate about this. And I know we're going to take all of that feedback and look at it all and incorporate it um, so that the end product is going to be something that can be usable. Um, we want, you know, we have that draft um, and glossary and checklist because what we're hoping is that if somebody's going through a migration that they are going to take these resources and pull them out and use them and share them with their internal colleagues um, to make sure that the migration goes as smoothly as it can. Um, and you can see if you go on the NISO site, um, there is a page right now um, for uh, the content platform migration um, project. And um, I, I am certain that the draft um, will be there um, during public comment period. But like I said, we will also be putting out um, everywhere that we can, we will be publicizing um, to get feedback. So um, we hope that you will um, consider taking a little bit of time um, to review and, and, and give us that feedback. And I think we're, we're ready for questions now. Awesome. Thank you all so much for um, talking to us about this. Uh, and I think we, we can agree that like this is an incredibly important topic. And I know as an e-resources librarian myself, I have definitely felt the pain and the joy of migrations as well. Um, so I only have I have one question coming in from the chat currently, but I please um, please folks, if you have other questions, please, please feel free to type them into the questions and answers and we will uh, answer them as they come in. Um, but uh, our first question is to, uh, it's from an anonymous attendee, uh, from what to uh, Matthew. Um, it seems Wiley's part in regarding change management is, is fine. I'm curious how you do or did, did you ensure your other partners implementing the change, especially in relation to the open URL did so in a timely manner? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and it's something that I kind of glossed over probably for good reason. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that was, when you talk about those other partners, right? I assume we're talking about library solutions vendors, right? So EBSCO, ProQuest 6 Libras, so CLC, and folks like that. Um, so it was very tricky because they, you know, we could give them the information up front as best as we could. Um, however, um, they kind of had to activate it at just the right time. And we were, my, my thought was that there would be kind of like a trickle down effect to all of this, but like in an actual, you know, good way, because if we hit the library solutions vendors with the right links and, and locations and mark records at the right time, there wouldn't be much action required by the individual libraries that it would just be a sort of a centralized um, distribution of this information. Um, but the, the question was really, I'm dancing around a bit, the question was sort of how did we ensure that? Well, um, it's really in the best interest of, 
of everyone, right? It's not just publishers and libraries, but also the vendors to make sure that they do this because uh, I don't wanna threaten anyone with an overwhelming number of support cases. Um, and traditionally in the industry, there is a bit of a blame game that happens between um, you know, publisher and library solutions vendor. Um, anyway, that dynamic exists, um, you know, it, it has before, it will after, um, but, but certainly the, there was incentive for these vendors to adopt it. Um, the, I will say that the smaller vendors were very quick right away. They, you know, they, they wanted to do right by their, our mutual users. Um, some of the bigger ones, I won't call out anyone by name, were, were um, a bit slower to get to it than we'd like, but um, you know, the vast majority, if they didn't do it the day after, they certainly made sure to do it in, um, you know, shortly thereafter, because like I said, they were really getting links to, um, you know, they, they were seeing a rise in support cases on their side and our side, right? And there's, there's only so much we can do as the stewards of this information, we push it out, but it, you know, in so many cases with metadata distribution, it's just as much on the vendor to ingest it and to make sure that it's right. So, um, no, I mean, I, I think that they did a, you know, they did a pretty good job. It's just that you would rather be proactive than re reactive in these situations, considering the scale um, and the, the number of mutual customers that some of our larger library solutions vendors have, right? Um, but I, I think that we got there. It was just sort of impressing the importance of this and um, being able to answer questions in real time. And I couldn't answer everything um, when I got a question from a, a vendor, you know, but I, I made darn sure that I spoke to whoever, needed, you know, on the Adapon side, for example, to understand, you know, uh, what they needed to know and get that back to them, um, which would, of course, we would um, incorporate into the FAQ. But um, there's mutual interest and we just really needed to make sure that, um, you know, everyone's needs were being met. Awesome. Thanks, Matthew. Can I, can I add to that? Yeah. I, um, yeah. So from um, another publisher perspective, we did have some challenges. Um, I think, you know, we're fairly small. And so getting attention from the larger um, discovery vendors, um, we found that challenging. And so two, two things to say there. Um, one, I think, you know, our lesson um, learned was to, you um, have those conversations earlier um, with partners and pull in our library, some of our trusted library customers. Um, so if a publisher happens to have an advisory board or just um, what we might call friends of the press um, who are willing to also go to their vendor to say, hey, wanna make sure everything is working right. Um, I think that that's helpful. Um, something that I didn't say um, during my presentation is, so we weren't able to have 50 people on um, our working group. We kept it, it's pretty small group, um, but it's worth saying that we did um, talk with um, and interview and have connections with um, different um, vendors, including discovery vendors who maybe didn't have um, a seat at the working group table, but we went to them um, to, to uh, and folks like Crossref, um, et cetera, um, to make sure that we were um, bringing their um, information and expertise um, into the recommended draft. So we did um, talk with those folks, even if they were not on the working group. Awesome. So I just had a kind of a follow up. Someone uh, said regarding Matthew's answer, Athena, what would you do to help with that kind of issue? And Kim kind of hit a little bit on like publishers bringing in libraries, but you know, what can libraries do to help with that issue? I um, It's one of the things I was thinking about uh, during Matthew's portion of our conversation today is that as you as they're reaching out to Crossref or to the discovery vendors and open your own vendors. Um, I would really love it if there were a way for us to know as a librarian if I log in to look at the discovery vendor, I would love to be able to tell that they already got the information and responded to it from uh, the migrating content or platform, but right now that's not there. So what I would do usually is if there is a problem, and that's usually when I start to be proactive about reaching out to, um, to 
the pro to resolve the problem. So I, I kind of assume that the information did go out to the discovery vendors and other service providers until I have evidence that it hasn't. And it's because I, my plate is really full. I don't really get a lot of time to get ahead of these things as much as maybe one could. But when there is a problem, what I do is I email both my contacts at the same time. And I would say, hey, Matthew, UCF can't access the content for Wiley through our auth authentication system. Did you, you know, and OCLC, is this the new stanza for Wiley? Or whoever it is that I need to put in contact. Because I can't assume which vendor is having the problem. Um, I really need them to work together to resolve it. And I'll feed them information and try and create tests that they can see what's exactly happening at UCF. Um, but really, I, I would contact both of them simultaneously. I, I hope that answered your question. Well, that is the only other question we have. Um, we do have about seven more minutes, according to my clock. So um, if anyone has any other questions, I want to give a pause for a little bit just to make sure that people have time uh, to type in uh, questions if you want. As I want to remind everyone, you've got this Q&A button down uh, at the bottom of your screen, and you should be able to type your question in there, and it will appear magically on our open questions panel. Um, so please feel free to do that. Um, and uh, I will also, I'll take this time as well to remind everyone that there is a uh, survey that will be coming and popping up uh, at the end of this webinar. Um, please feel, please not feel free, but we would please like you to take that survey. It really does help us. Um, and of course, please be on the lookout for additional NASIG uh, webinars. We are really trying to up our webinar levels uh, this year um, and trying to do ones once a month or uh, at least once every other month because of the fact that we are all sitting in our little isolated pods and we feel that webinars right now are of vital importance. Uh, so, um, Still not saying any questions. Come on, guys. This is a great panel. I guess you guys answered everything. Uh, I, have, I have a question for the group. And um, I know that the, the chat only goes to all panelists, but I'm curious how many of the attendees um, would be uh, planning to look at the recommended practice and get feedback when it comes out, sort of recruiting in advance. I've seen folks, uh, one, two, we've got a lot of folks. We've got like six folks already saying that they will, for sure. Some hands raised. Two participants have raised their hands. So we've got a good amount of folks who are interested. I know I'm really excited because I, let's, let's, let's just put it out there. I used to be on the eight elect standards committee and this is kind of my dorkiness. Uh, I know I will be looking at it very excitedly. Um, so we look like we've got eight folks at least who are interested in looking at the document. I think, well, uh, if anyone has any other final questions, if not, I just want to thank you all so much for giving this webinar and um, getting us at NASIC to try out some new technology, always exciting. Um, and it was just really wonderful. I think it was a really useful and valuable webinar for our community. Um, and thanks to you all who are watching on YouTube as well. And as I said, this will be going up. You will all be receiving uh, a recording of this uh, for, for posterity uh, and to review at a later date if you attended this webinar. So thanks everyone. And I am going to stop recording. <laughs>